The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. During his lifetime, Idris Shah promoted contacts and connections between different traditions around the world, believing this to be an important element in the advancement of human culture. In this spirit, the Idris Shah Foundation has created Cultural Crossroads, a website forum where people from many walks of life are invited to talk about their own experiences crossing cultural boundaries and the lessons that they have learned as a result. You can find these articles on the ISF blog. Richard Lloyd Parry is the Asia editor of The Times, based in Tokyo for over 20 years, and the author of three outstanding books about the region, including Ghosts of the Tsunami, winner of the prestigious Folio Prize in 2018. It's great to be able to talk to Richard Lloyd Parry, uh, author of the uh, prize-winning and outstanding book Ghosts of the Tsunami, uh, about the tragedy of uh, Fukushima in Japan, and also uh, People Who Eat Darkness, another fascinating insight into the world of the Japanese psyche and also how foreigners deal with that and interact with it. And um, Richard's lived for over 20 years now in in Tokyo, reporting for uh, major newspapers, in The Independent and The Times. And uh, I just wondered at first, Richard, what what has really changed what sort of has changed maybe subtly since since you first arrived in japan yeah it's a good question i mean when you live somewhere of course uh, and and it's your home and you're there all the time then it's like your children growing up you don't uh, you don't necessarily notice the changes so starkly as people who come and go every few years but japan and certainly tokyo where i live superficially has changed a lot. It's one of those cities which are constantly being torn down and rebuilt uh, as the economy you know, blossoms and booms. And, you know, I, I've got very used now to the experience of walking down a street where perhaps I haven't walked for a couple of weeks and finding that a familiar building there, which I knew has disappeared and there's a there's a blank plot, or there's a new building going up. And, and that happens all the time. So Tokyo is constantly being destroyed and regenerated in that way. But in terms of, you know, you, you use the word the, um, the Japanese psyche. I mean, I, I know what you mean by that. I'm not sure. Whether, I don't know whether countries actually have psyches in the way that people do. But everyone knows, you know, what, what that means. And Japan as, as a society changes much more slowly very slowly indeed it's a um it's a conservative society conservative with a small c um it's a very successful society and people are aware that they are spared social problems that people in western europe you know north america don't have to deal with they have very low crime rates uh, you know, high social stability, very high levels of, of, of service, uh, and a lack of the kind of, uh, you know, bad temper and grumpiness and, and, and day-to-day superficial conflict that you just get used to if you live in a big Western city. Um, but having said all that, Japan, that there have been changes in Japan. Japan is now, for example, governed by the most right-wing conservative with large C nationalistic government it has had really, I think, since since the end of the Second World War, certainly in, for the 24 years I've been here. Uh, Mr. Abe, Shinzo Abe, is, is a conservative nationalist. He has done thing, no, things that no one else has, like given the Japanese self-defense forces the authority to conduct operations outside Japan, which they could never do in the past. And his ambition, he has as his ambitions to change the, the constitution and further restore Japan to 
what, what people sometimes refer to here as a normal country, a country not constrained by the, 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 the constitutional rules uh, which make it uh, unable to send its armed forces around the world. So those, those are, are, are big ambitions and, and big changes. Now, they, he hasn't been able to fully implement the, the kind of changes he wanted. They've caused a lot of unease here. But one, one big difference that I've noticed certainly in the last 10 years is that the, the right wing in Japan, the, the political right, is a lot more confident than it was. I don't know that they're necessarily more numerous or have public support, but partly because of Mr. Abe and his election success, people on the right are more confident now in, in articulating their point of view about the Constitution, about history, in ways that in the old days people felt constrained from doing. That's fascinating. I, is that going to have any impact on the rise of Chinese influence, which must have been also noticeable? Yeah, I mean, Japan, I think, is feeling more and more uncomfortable about the, the geopolitical neighbourhood in which it finds itself. And that, of course, is something that you know, countries simply can't change. Uh, I mean, the, the story of Western Europe, in fact, all of Europe since the Second World War, has been one of steady decrease in tensions and, and political and economic integration. I mean, it would have seemed astonishing, uh, you know, a little over a generation ago, the idea that, that France and Germany, who fought wars every few decades for centuries in Europe, would, in the 21st century, share a currency, for example, be integrated to that extent. But it's happened, and it's amazing. And, you know, Brexit notwithstanding, that the European project has been an astonishing thing. Now, nothing like that has, has happened in East Asia. The, the tensions that were exposed in the Pacific War are, you know, are certainly less than they were, but that they are still there. there is, there's a great deal of mutual suspicion between the powerful countries of East Asia, Japan and South Korea and, and China. And South Korea, uh, China rather, is getting more and more powerful and will continue to get powerful as its population and its economy grow and its military power grows. Uh, and Japan also faces the, you know, the much more obvious and, and immediate threat from, from North Korea. And that is creating a, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of insecurity. You know, in, in Western Europe, the, the Cold War is 30 years ago now, we no longer feel that, that threat from the Soviet Union, from, from the Eastern Bloc. In, in Japan, that, that threat has gone. There's no longer fear of you know, invasion from the Soviet Union, which is what Japan was defending itself against for many years. But you do have these, these vaguer, broader, longer-term threats. You know, where, where is China going uh, and how is North Korea going to end up? Just returning now to, to the, yes, the Japanese psyche, because you're right, we, we'd feel a bit nervous about having talking about a French or an English psyche, but we very commonly talk about the Japanese psyche. They seem to invite it, and, uh, themselves even. And with all the research that you did for your book about Fukushima and the interviews you carried out, did that reveal surprising or different aspects to the Japanese psyche? I, I learned a lot about Japan as I was researching and writing about the, uh, the, the tsunami, it's true, for some reason, we are more inclined to generalize about 130 million Japanese people than we would be about 250 million Americans or 65 million British. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that Japanese do, do have a tendency to generalize about themselves. I don't think we should necessarily follow them in that. You know, it is, it is always more complicated. And I think the longer you live in a country and you live, certainly it's been my experience, the longer I've lived in Japan, the, the more difficult I find it to generalize. You know, you, you become more aware of the, of the exceptions and the, the complexity of all these questions. But, you know, the question of whether that, that double disaster, the tsunami and then the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident, which is separate, really. I mean, one caused the other, but they were, you know, different catastrophes, one natural, one man-made. The question of what that, 
has done to the country is interesting. I mean, um, the area immediately affected, the coastline of northeast Japan and Fukushima Prefecture, has certainly been been profoundly changed. And even though the the physical mess is in some ways, in a lot of ways, has been cleared up, the the psychological impact of that and the, the the trauma not only to individuals but to a whole whole communities is still very evident when you go up there and that's one of the things that i was writing about in in ghosts of the tsunami the rest of japan has has moved on i think most of all um the there's certainly more anxiety about nuclear energy than there used to be um that has not translated into a change in government policy. Mr. Abe is determined that Japan will continue to derive much of its electricity from, from nuclear power stations. I, I don't think that's, that's going to work in the long run for various complicated global reasons of which the Fukushima accident was one. Um, you know, nuclear energy, I think, is, is in decline. It's, um, uh, you know, it's looking more and more as if other alternative renewable energy sources are going to be the, the way forward in the future. But anyway, he he's pushing on with that, and most people don't want him to. Japanese disasters, disaster preparedness has, has always been quite good, in fact. I mean, that um, the, the, the tsunami killed 18,500 people, which is a you know, monumental number of people to die at a stroke like that. But if it had happened anywhere else in the world... It would have been many times worse. Um, it sounds strange to say that, but it's true. Japanese buildings are strong. They don't, the modern buildings don't fall down in earthquakes. And the sea walls are, are, are there. The evacuation drills are all in place. So, you know, that, that, that disaster was, was terrible, but it could have been a great deal worse than it was. I mean, what we, we get there is is Japan is, has faced these sort of disaster tsunamis and earthquakes since the beginning of their history. And are they are they better at working together? I mean, that's a very generalised question, but it's it's always struck me that when they're in a tight situation, they're quite good at, at, at all pulling together. Was that your experience or not? There were many amazing things about reporting that disaster um, and the physical destruction and the scale and scope of it was was one of those but also one of the most impressive things was the way that especially in the immediate aftermath in the first few days after this wave had come in and retreated the way that Japanese communities faced that I mean there was in the first few days there really wasn't much official help it took a few days you know for the the authorities to come to their centres and get organised and, and begin to mobilise, which they did fairly soon. But in the first few days, there was, there was no chaos. Um, Japanese communities are very tight-knit, very well organised, and they're very good at getting on with things in their own way in the absence of official help. And that was very impressive. But there's another side to that. I mean, part of that is that people early on didn't, didn't have high expectations of the government, um, I, I often thought when I was up there that if one could imagine something similar happening in in my own country, in my own culture, you know, if at a stroke that hundreds of thousands of people were, were homeless and had to live in school gymnasiums, then it would be very, very different. And one of the things that would be different is that people would be demanding that the government came in and, and helped them. Um, and people in Japan weren't doing that. And in the early days, that was much to their advantage. But actually, in the long run, low expectations of your government are, uh, can be a very negative and, and, and a very corrosive thing. I mean, the fact is, I think when you talk to a lot of Japanese people, they, they have low expectations of politicians at all times. There is a, a disillusion, uh, almost a resignation about the capacities and the, the, the failures of, of, of party politics and, and politicians to meet the needs of ordinary people. Um, it's almost as if sometimes politics was a natural disaster of which Japanese people are the helpless victims. 
But of course, it's not like that. It's a, a functioning parliamentary democracy with free elections, a free press. Everyone has their say. It, it often doesn't feel like that. People don't feel like that. They don't feel a, a responsiveness from their politicians or really that they are responsible for the people they elect and, and put in power. And that kind of sort of detachment from, from the government uh, works very well when you're dealing with the aftermath of a disaster for a few days. But in the long run, it's a, a very bad thing, I believe. Interesting. I mean, is that is that just something that's getting worse? Or is that is that is a, are they heading towards a, a, a greater separation between the sort of everyday lives and the political elite? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that. No, I think it's been a, a feature of Japanese life for a while. I mean, one one of the problems is one of the interesting things about Mr. Abe is that he is an extremely successful politician in the sense that he's won significant majorities in in all the elections he's fought but he's not actually i believe very popular uh, so why why does he keep getting elected the answer is that the opposition in japan really doesn't function there isn't a strong even a credible opposition party at the moment the opposition is is atomized balkanized divided weak it doesn't have strong personalities. It doesn't have its attractive leaders. Um, and this is the reason that um, Shinzo Abe keeps getting elected, not because people like him. A lot of people vote for him, I think, although they mistrust and even dislike him. But there really isn't anyone else credible who you could vote for. There's no one with a plan. There's no one with the experience, with the skills, with the confidence. Um, so, you know, to that extent, that's been true for a while. There is something of a crisis in Japanese politics, a crisis of leadership and a crisis of opposition, because the system is designed along Westminster model. And that only works when you have a, a government, a majority government, which is held in check and held to account by a loyal opposition. And in Japan, at the moment, the opposition isn't there. Living as you have, as a foreigner, with your own family, you're an outsider, which is, of course, is a, is a very good position as a journalist in many ways. But what are the niggling everyday difficulties of of, of living in Japan that uh, that you just put up with, or or? <laughs> as you know, because you've lived here, um, Japan takes a bit of getting used to, and one of the uh, the uh, the the beloved hobbies and pastimes of foreigners who live in Japan is whinging about Japan. I, I, I imagine that's true everywhere. I mean, I'm sure that Japanese expats in London sit around in the, you know, in the sushi restaurant of London whinging about the British as well, and with good reason. Uh, and, you know, I think people go, go through, through cycles of this. You know, you see it in, in people who are arriving. There's often a kind of um, uh, infatuation in the early, the early weeks and months and even the early years because Japan is a very delightful and uh, you know, fascinating and enchanting place in many ways, and life here is very good. But then, you know, people often become a bit grumpy and disillusioned. I mean, I, I've been through so many of those cycles now. I, I think I've reached a kind of Zen acceptance of it all, <laughs> and I don't, I don't really get bothered by things. I mean, the the thing is, uh, you know, there are there are great differences between Japanese society and my own, but. Because I've been here a long time and because I write about it and I try to understand it for my job, I, you know, I understand the reasons why. I, um, and, and the differences are, are, are the things I like. One of the things that, um, uh, that, that often annoys people is, um, is the, an, an exaggerated or excessive um, regard for rules. I mean, not all that long ago, I, um, I went into a, a, a coffee shop and I wanted to wanted to have what's called the morning set, which is a nice cup of coffee and a slice of toast. And it's, it's very cheap. You get a little deal in the morning. And they serve this, you know, until 9.30 in the morning in the local coffee shop. And I went in there and, and uh, I was running a bit behind and uh, I said, I'd like the, the morning set, please, with, with toast and a little boiled egg. And they said, I'm, I'm so sorry, we only do that till 9.30. And I looked at my watch and it, it was indeed 9.30 and 45 seconds. It, the the nine thirty mark had had passed. I said, well, you know, since it's only 
9.31 now, could you not make an exception and, and, and serve me my, my toast, my coffee? And, um, and no, this was impossible. And that sort of thing is, is very annoying. But on the other hand, the, you know, the converse of that is that because of this extremely strict regard for rules and schedules and timekeeping, that's one of the reasons why Japanese public transport is so good and the, the trains run right on time because a 30-second delay in the departure of the train is regarded as a disciplinary offence on the part of the driver. And for that reason, among others, the trains run on time and we all, we all benefit as a result. So I try not to get too bothered by these things. I had to, had to hold myself back in from uh, laughing out loud about the, 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 the seto because I, I remember those well and uh, being denied, <laughs> denied that. It must have been so annoying. Um, I, I even once, once I said, uh, it was a few years back, I said uh, a similar situation. I said, well, I'm only a minute late. And they said, I'm sorry, we, we don't have any toast. I said, really? At, at exactly 9.30, you ran out of, of bread? And I said, yes. And I said, okay, I'm going to go and buy some bread, bring it to you, and you can make it for me. And I did. I went to the convenience store, bought the bread, and they made the toast for me on the spot. <laughs> so that, that was, as, as you'll appreciate, that in, in a, a Japanese context, that was a very, very aggressive and neat thing to do, and I, I wouldn't do it again. It was brilliant. Well, I think that's been a, a really good uh, chat and insight into into Japan, and um, and I really recommend people to read Richard's book, Richard Lloyd Parry's book, Ghosts of the Tsunami, and find out more about Japan. And uh, thank you so much for that. Well, well, thank you, Rob. And w w while we're we're on the subject, we should also recommend that everyone reads Angry White Pajamas by Robert Twigger, ah. which is a, a classic of its kind, one of the, not only a great sports book, but a great book about Japan as well. You're a true gentleman, sir, a true gentleman. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.